This is a 52-year-old female skier who suffered a rupture to her anterior cruciate ligament while skiing. Here the exam demonstrates the anterior draw and Lachman test, confirming her instability. Her ACL reconstruction is going to be performed with a sterilized bone patellar tendon bone allograft, which we believe is the strongest donor tissue to use. We never use Achilles tendon or other tissues as we believe they're not well designed for ACL reconstruction and we've stopped using patellar tendon and never did use hamstrings to reconstruct ruptured anterior cruciate ligaments. Our results have been the same or better using sterilized bone patellar tendon bone allograft from donors younger than 40 for both older folks as well as young athletes. Here the ACL is initially examined and as is common, the fibers initially appear intact but upon probing are clearly completely ruptured at the mid-body of the ACL. The shaver is brought into place, the fibers are debrided, taking care to identify the anatomic insertion site for the ACL on the femur. The remainder of the knee is carefully probed, the meniscus cartilage examined on its superior and inferior surfaces throughout. The articular cartilage is noted to be intact, there's a small amount of fraying in the lateral meniscus but generally intact throughout for both the meniscus and the articular cartilage. Based on this we turn our attention to the anterior cruciate ligament identify the intercolonial notch and the anatomic insertion site. We then pass a gaff through the knee, taking care to exit the posterior lateral side of the knee. A small portal is made for the gaff to pass through. The rear entry guide is then hooked on to the gaff and brought into the knee joint. The tip of the rear entry guide is placed in the mid aspect of the anatomic insertion site for the anterior cruciate ligament. A bullet from outside in is then placed, a small incision is placed through the iliotibial band and clearing it down to the bone. The bullet is then placed onto the bone and a guide pin passed to the tip of the rear entry guide. The guide pin position is then checked both from the anterior medial and the anterior lateral portals to assure that it arrives at the anatomic insertion site. If not, a parallel drill guide is brought into place and a second guide pin passed into the anatomic insertion site. Again, care is taken to view this from both anterior medial and anterior lateral portals and confirm the placement in the center of the anatomic insertion site for the ACL. It's worth noting that every femur is slightly different and the drill that passes over the drill pin will create a five millimeter hole posterior and a five millimeter hole anterior to the drill pin, creating a 10 millimeter socket. By using a rear entry guide, the pin placement can be carefully adjusted to each unique femur and the edges are smoothed to ensure that there's no tissue entrapment. Notice that there's a small amount of articular cartilage and rim left posterior to the drill socket and that the socket itself replaces the anatomic insertion site. A flexible suture passer is then passed from outside in, excess soft tissue cleared, the suture is grasped and brought out anterior medially. A white plug is then placed to block the fluid exit. A triangle guide is then brought into the anterior medial tibial spine, is placed just on the superior tip, slightly on the lateral side of the tip of the medial spine, and a drill pin passed up to it. Again, confirmation of the drill pin placement is made by extending the knee and observing its location in relationship to the thermal condyle and the PCL and replacement with a parallel drill pin should be performed until the pin placement is ideal. Here the pin is placed directly through the ACL footprint and confirmation of its placement and position is performed by extending and flexing the knee. A curette is placed to protect the drill pin and a 10 millimeter drill brought from outside in. Excess tissue is cleared with a shaver and biter. A shaver is brought up through the tunnel to ensure that there's no sharp edge on the posterior aspect of the drill tunnel that might impinge on the ACL graft. This ensures a smooth transition of the new ACL graft down through the tibia. After the tunnel is drilled and smoothed, uh, the suture passer is passed and then a Gore-Tex smoother brought up through the knee to ensure that the tunnels are smooth throughout. 
-hmm. Attention is then turned to the bone pituitary tendon bone graft, which is a sterilized graft. The bone blocks on each end of the graft are then sized in order to fit through a 9 millimeter sizer. The tibial block is shortened to a length of 25 millimeters to ensure that it can pass smoothly through the knee and through the tibial tunnel. Drill holes are then placed in the tibial block at right angles to each other so that the block can pull through the tunnel smoothly. Drill holes are then placed on the femoral side. We attach a retrobutton XL to ensure that the bone block does not pass down through the femoral tunnel. The midsection of the bone patellar tendon bone graft is marked. The graft is then passed through the knee joint from the femur to the tibia. We then tap the retro button down to the femoral surface to ensure solid abutment. Once the femoral side is secure to the cortex of the femur, we then turn our attention to the tibial bone block. We provide tension on the graft and cycle the knee 20 cycles to remove stretch from the ACL graft. We then place a guide pin, followed by a tap, followed by a 10 by 23 millimeter Milagro screw to provide interference fit fixation. The graft is then checked to ensure that there's no impingement throughout the full range of motion. Marking instilled and the patient is returned to the post-operative recovery room in good condition. Post-operatively, we permit our patients to fully weight bear. We use crutches for a few days while the swelling resolves. We start an immediate fitness program on day one post-operatively with the physical therapist. We start immediate manual physical therapy in order to reduce swelling and increase range of motion on day one postoperatively and every day thereafter that the patient is available. Patients who get into physical therapy for daily PT with massage therapy, with range of motion exercises, with fitness training, do the best. Our goal for our patients is to return them fitter, faster, and stronger than they were before they were hurt. And so physical therapy merges into fitness conditioning and does not stop until the patient has attained their goals. We insist on full equal extension to the opposite knee as we have all learned that any loss of motion leads to anterior knee pain over time. Obtaining full range of motion early is the most important part of the post-operative physical therapy program. Patients always inquire about return to sports. Return to sports, in our opinion, is based on the patients regaining their strength and agility and proprioception and being able to pass a series of sports and agility tests in our clinic. We counsel the patient that all graphs mature over the course of a year and consistently get stronger during that time. And while many patients are ready to return to full contact sports at earlier than one year, there is an increased risk of re-rupture if they do so. Patients are counseled that lifetime of strengthening and fitness is the best way to protect their knee, and using their ACL injury as an excuse to learn more about being fit and obtaining that fitness level for a lifetime is the most important part of our teaching of our injured patients.